going to do the talk back here. It's going to be on a YouTube site, and it'll be shared widely. And what we're talking about here is some of the people who are involved in children's issues, whether it's gun violence or um, different things that involve children and social justice. So I'd like to uh, introduce everybody. This is Aaron Graves. Barbara Montgomery, Jeff Dempsey, Makai Boone, Maya Bellardo, and Mike Boone. Look at the children who are in the, the, the immigration situation with the, all the children who are sitting in basically prisons. Um, and if we look through the history, let's just say even of this country, what the children have endured doing slavery, doing oppression, doing all, all the uh, phases of this country, usually the children get the short end of the stick. And then the children grow up to be adults. So now the adults have traumas as children that have not been identified, and adults are still choosing decisions based on traumas from the childhood. So now, not only are the children suffering, but the, a, a lot of the adults are suffering because they are, have not identified the trauma in their childhood. So the children are catching hell. And then um, what's really powerful is that the children are not called victims. They're saying these children are bad children. These children are out of hand. These children, these children, these children. So they say when you point one finger, there's three fingers pointing back at you. So it's incredible to see a person, people say, an adult, I don't want to be around those kids. As if that adult came into life as an adult. That adult was never born a child. So whatever happened in that childhood was so traumatic to them that for a, an adult to make a statement that those, those children, without any relationship to their own childhood, is a devastating comment. I'd like to introduce um, Barbara Montgomery, who was the president of the Million Mom March for Pennsylvania and the Brady Campaign. And she has an awful lot to say about um, the marches that she did, how effective they were, and I guess what she sees in the future, what is needed to be um, really uh, addressed for the future. Thank you, Suzanne, and thanks for uh, the opportunity for putting the arts and, and, and social justice together. Um, I didn't plan on becoming the head of the Million Mom March chapters of the Brady Campaign, which is now Brady United. Um, I had my own experiences with gun violence, but it was in Vietnam. Uh, I spent several years during the war there and came back to this country thinking, that's over there, and had to deal with my own trauma from that. Had my children and was very conscious of what was happening, as Aaron so rightly pointed out. I could see what was happening to the children of South Vietnam so clearly what was happening and how the generations were going to be manifesting that war for generations to come. So I was absolutely wanting to make sure my kids would be as safe as I could have them be in a culture which is, it was pretty violent then, but to see what's happened now is, is frightening on, on many levels. However, when my daughter was, um, she's 32 now, when she was 14, and you think about the, the mass shootings all the time, but you don't think about the eight, nine children who are killed every day in this country. It's terrible that we have the mass shootings that we've had for so very long, but they get all the headlines, but the everyday violence, and that everyday violence is coming from so many different places. And my daughter experienced with her best friend in um, middle school was shot and killed, and the whole family of five. So when that happened, I couldn't just sit by and not do anything, and the school had an assembly, and that was it. They thought it was going to be okay after that. Ceasefire PA is the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's 
largest independent gun violence prevention organization. We do educational work throughout the Commonwealth of PA. And then our primary goal is to get people taking that next step to engage with their legislators in a meaningful way, uh, demanding the sort of change that they need to see. You know, so often we hear from lawmakers, nobody in my district cares about this, or this isn't really a concern, or we don't have a gun violence problem. And you know, that anybody who says that is just clearly not paying attention. We lose more people in the United States uh, to, to gunshots, to gun violence, than we do to car accidents. We lose about 40,000 people a year in the United States. And gun violence takes many different forms. It takes the form of homicide. It takes the form of suicide. It takes the form of domestic violence and intimate partner violence. It takes the form of children who find guns in the home, um, play with them, and accidentally harm themselves and others. And what we see most common is that gun violence doesn't just stop with the victim. It shatters families. It ripples out into the community. It completely upends people and families' lives. Um, gun violence is inherently a children's issue because ultimately it's our children that bear the brunt of it, whether it's a loss of a loved one or it's gun violence inflicted upon them. Uh, we're in the city of Philadelphia. You know, the young men that are being shot every day uh, are nothing but children. And you know, we turn a blind eye, it doesn't get the sort of coverage that the latest mass shooting gets, but the reality is, is Philadelphia deals with mass shootings on an all too regular and all too familiar basis. And in this movement, we talk about the body count. We don't even talk about the thousands and thousands of people who are shot, who survive, but who lose the ability to work or to provide for their loved ones or to function who deal with decades uh, later results. I was talking to a survivor the other day who had to have his leg amputated from a gunshot he had received 25 years ago. That's two decades that this person's been dealing with the ramifications of these injuries. So you know we have to do something. And sadly, too many folks in our government throw their hands in the air. They say things like, well, you know, we've got to do something about violent video games, antidepressants, and the breakdown of the family unit. Um, we heard some legislators in Harrisburg say that just a few weeks ago. So I don't buy that. Ceasefire PA doesn't buy it. And as citizens of the Commonwealth, we shouldn't buy it. I, we don't buy that bad guys will just be bad guys. We don't buy that there's nothing that we can do about it. We don't buy that, well, you know, the evidence on these laws may not have stopped this mass shooting. When did we stop becoming a society, a government, and a people that want results and want to tackle the issues that we face head on. Um, we don't think that anyone should just sit by and say, well, the Second Amendment says that we're all allowed to have a weapon of war or a weapon that can lay waste to 50 people in 10 minutes or a weapon that makes kids feel uncomfortable in school um, or a weapon that makes something like a backyard barbecue become a hunting ground. You know, the reality is, is it is access to firearms we have to address it, we have to address it uh, vigorously, and we've got to put some laws in place that get guns out of the hands of folks who shouldn't have them.
my generation and guns. Um, so like in my school, since I go to a public school, a lot of people don't care. I think it's like maybe like a handful of people that actually do care and care about gun violence and stuff like that. Because I know a couple of people who have family, like um, Chester, PA. Um, a lot of people who live there, they got a lot of family that like passed away from gun violence and stuff like that. So it's like, it's not a lot of people who um, care. And because like they're all obsessed with video games, with gun violence, or just any type of violence, um, they're like, oh yeah, you like that AK-47 or something? It's like, no, I don't. <laughs> In my neighborhood, which, um, yeah, in Wilmington, like he said, there is a lot of gun violence. Um, Especially like where I live, I've there have been shootings. Like my mom used to have a daycare, and we used to get really scared just hearing a sound, like any sound. Like it's the scariest thing. Like yeah, like especially lately. Um, I lived in New York. Um, I just moved back, and I lived there for three years. And legit, any sound people hear, we just people dog or stuff like that, and it's terrible that we have to do that nowadays and I agree with him like our our generation is kind of concerned but I feel like we kind of like repost something on Instagram and then that's it like we don't really do anything else about it we'll talk about it a little bit but I feel like we're not as concerned as we should be um you know people don't really aren't concerned until it happens to them sadly but um yeah I think we need to talk about it more, for sure. But we don't have these conversations that much with, yeah, so. I just think um, a lot of the politicians, a lot of the big ups, they just, they've just been bought out by groups like the NRA. I mean, can I, you know, I mean, let's face it, that organization has a lot of people in their pockets, a lot of good meaning people that say a lot of good things to get elected. But, you know, we, we've witnessed all kinds of shootings. You know, are we basically dealing with gun violence, you know, because there's other stuff. I mean, there's child abductions. That's a whole, maybe that's another series. I worry about him, you know, because he's walking to school with his friends. He goes to play in an area that's actually where we live in Wilmington. We're at the top North Wilmington, so it's probably one of the nicer parts. But still, there's like areas and we, you know, just, I, I worry about him. Um, but back to the NRA, um, I just think, some folks are just scared. Um, this is my kind of ugly topic, but this current administration has seemed to just um, lift the scab off of the racism that's probably been underlying you know since the beginning of this country. So you have a lot of that, a lot, a lot of you know, shootings um, racially motivated. I mean, we just witnessed the Botham Jean case. I mean, I know that's an adult, um, but just the whole idea of um, folks 
hiding behind that Second Amendment thing. I mean, everybody should protect themselves. I, I get that. I get that. But there's no reason why you can walk into a store or, and buy an AK-47, and you have to be you have to buy get a driver's license. You have to be a certain age to buy cigarettes. But you can walk into an AK, you know, or you can go across state lines and and buy a weapon and not have any background checks. I mean, simple, simple stuff. You know, you know, and people are freaking out. And every time something happens, it's like our thoughts and prayers. And it's like, that's, that's, just, a, that's just another line. So I, I don't know what it's going to take, but um, I, I, until it happens to you know, your immediate family, it's, people are just anesthetized. We just have to talk about it more and just get out and vote, you know, and try to vote for people that are, understand the issue because these children are the future. They're traumatized, all these, you know, they, they're going to grow up. And you have generations of people that have been involved in, you know, activity. You know, I, 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 this, I'm kind of emotional now. It's hard to say. And I have a hard time picking my words. But um, it's going to take some serious action and maybe and some legislation. I, I, I don't understand why we don't have background checks, universal background checks. I don't understand what simple things, you know, we're not talking about, you know, taking away, you know, the First Amendment right, but it's got, it's got to be balanced, you know, and some folks seem to not get it or they just don't want to get it. Um, I think the big thing we all talked about, you know, we have a, uh, you know, issues about, um, you know, different generations, you know, um, you know, not processing trauma. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, people going to, you know, our um, you know, local governments um, and everything. But I think the big thing, you know, we really talked about is money. Because Mike talked about the NRA. And, you know, we talk about how oh, we're, we're trying to vote these people in the office. But, and, you know, you talked about how, oh, well, you know, the people we, the people we, we vote for initially on the campaign trail, well, they say all these good things. As soon as they get in the office, Oh hey, hey! You know, don't you know, don't don't talk about the gun stuff too much. We'll pay you x x amount, you know, to not you know to not talk about it. And then, you know, we have these um, you know, we have, we have these really big, you know we have these really big marches, you know, um, every every few months or you know once a year. It makes a big thing on on TV, and then it's gone. So we need to keep things you know. We need to keep the conversation moving forward at all times. So um, um, I guess violence is part of our DNA, unfortunately, but we don't have to cater to that, you know, to that lesser side. We can always choose to grow and be better people and to say, OK, instead of me trying to fight you or me trying to shoot you, let's try and resolve this peacefully. You know, because pe I, I think another thing people don't think about is that when you kill somebody, when you shoot somebody, when you shoot to kill, you know, and they're dead, it's all their hopes, all their dreams, it's gone, it's over with. And so I think people need to put themselves, you know, in their shoes. Okay, well, if I get shot and you know, if I die, all my hopes and dreams are gone too. You know, all the kids I could have had, all the memories I could have had, you know, the impact I could have had on society, gone. But the conversation, it, 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 needs, to, it, it needs to continue. It needs to not just be in, in, in small areas like this where it's intimate, but where it's out in the open consistently. All the time until we get answers. To go to, you know, until we go to, until we go to our uh, people that we vote for, you know, whether it's in Pennsylvania, whether it's in Texas or California or wherever. So hey, this is what we need. People need to be outside offices. You know, don't go to work, or you know, if, if you can, you know, we need to mobilize. You know, mass. You know, mass. At, you know, we we need to mobilize as many people as possible. Say okay, enough's enough. Uh, my name is Will Reed, but. Uh, um, I mean, just, just to question, I think, talking about my generation, I think I'm a little bit maybe older than, than you, I'm 32, but this is the first generation that's not going to do better than their parents did. And um, I think people are seeing their student loans, I think people are seeing that they can't afford to get a house, they can't afford to have a kid. Um, and they're facing real economic uncertainty and lack of opportunity, and, and I think people are lashing out. Um, to tell you the truth, I don't, you know, I don't think it's 
right, but I think part of that is from that and seeing just the the corruption in the government and seeing how everything is rigged against you. What do you, you know? What are you supposed to do? Everybody was told they were going to be the next big star or they were going to be the next great sports athlete, and they come out. Um, and that's not going to happen. So I said, oh, well, at least go to college and you'll get a job. A lot of folks don't have a job. They're driving for Uber. Um, but then, I mean, if you think about where we're at right now, we're here in Kensington, where just up the road a piece, uh, there's communities that have been disinvested in for the past 50 years. I know people whose grandfathers were drug dealers and their dads were drug dealers and now they're drug dealers. And so a lot of this violence is also coming from economic reasons. People are fighting for space trying to sell their drugs just to feed their families. So, um, you know, we, we can take away, uh, you know, guns, and, and I, think, I think that's a good first step. We also have to talk about investment in our communities, investment in our youth, um, so that our generation can continue to do better, um, you know? Or even if, if we're still gonna be here in 50 years, because who knows what's gonna happen with climate change. So, there's another pressure. So, um, <laughs> That, that's, that's another one, but I'm, I'm just saying we have to also look at it from an economic standpoint. So I think to answer or to just sort of touch on the question about you know why is it our children's lives are so cheap? Um, obviously, the NRA is just an incredibly toxic organization, and I would say that one thing that I think that's great that came from Parkland is those students in particular told everyone to kind of ditch their thoughts and prayers and had no problem highlighting the toxicity of the NRA. And we see corporations responding to that. We see, you know, lots of folks sort of, you know, giving them the, the you know, uh, turning the cheek and not giving them the time of day. And I think you see some lawmakers who are starting, starting to become afraid. Now, sadly, that hasn't happened in the White House yet. But, you know, there are lots of lawmakers who are starting to become a little wary. But to the question about why are our kids' lives so cheap, you know, I think there's lots of answers, but one of which is, you know, we have this myth that there are good guys with guns and there are bad guys with guns, you know? I'm a, I'm a law-abiding gun owner and blah, blah, blah. And the reality is, you know, it's not quite that simple, right? The Las Vegas shooter was a law-abiding gun owner up until the moment that he broke the hotel window. Yeah. And then the next moment where he laid waste to 50 people in 10 minutes. Right? So, you know, law abiding gun owners can become non law abiding gun owners really quick, right? And we see this in intimate partner violence. I mean, I don't think that kids come out of the womb saying, I want to be a domestic abuser. But when they become a domestic abuser, having guns in the home increases the likelihood of lethality by almost 500%. Right? So we've got to stop breaking it down that there's just good people with guns and bad people with guns. And the reality is, is it always comes back to this issue of access. Who has access? Um, we're coming up on the anniversary of this, the Tree of Life synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, right? Uh, the biggest attack committed against Jews in, in the United States history. And the reality is, you know, again, hate and anti-Semitism, they're not new concepts. They've been around for a very long time. But it's that equipment with a weapon of war that makes it potentially, you know, exponentially more deadly, rather. So I think, you know, when we get back to this, you know, I'm a law-abiding gun owner. When we look at school shootings, oftentimes those guns that are used in school shootings come from the home of law-abiding gun owners. So we've really got to break down this myth that, you know, there's this big, bold separation between the good guys with guns and the bad guys with guns, and, and really have a conversation about what it is, the guns. And just, you know, the one other point I, I would make about the importance of legislation, I'm a political geek, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's just my bread and butter. Um, actions have consequences, and inaction has consequences, right? And when our legislators fail to act, when they look you in the eye and smile and say, I'm with you on that issue, that can't be good enough. We have to demand more from all of our elected officials on all level of governments. And that's a little bit on us too. We've gotta to be a smarter constituency. And it's tough, because there's a lot of things to worry about. There's a lot of things to struggle for. There's a lot of things to, to have to keep our eye on. But what happens is I think the legislature, when they feel like they're not being watched, when they think they can get away with it, that's when they do. You know, and I have people tell me all the time, I call Pat Toomey's office every day. And I'm like, that's great. But what about your state representative or your state senator? And they go, I don't know who that is. 
right? Sometimes what happens on Harrisburg, what happens is, is just as important for us as what happens in D.C. Right. And again, it's not fair that we've got to really keep these people on their toes, but we have to. So I think that we have a responsibility to, you know, work with all kinds of great organizations who do that work, whatever your issue is, to, to really know what's going on on our local levels and, and to hold those folks accountable as well. It was 4% of the NRA membership back in when I was involved and doing everything. 4% was the squeaky wheel calling their representatives every day. They were the tail that wagged the dog. It, and, and also the absolutely insane leadership of Wayne LaPierre and everybody else and the money, the money, the money, because the money seems to be, especially now, more important than our children's lives. The greed, the power, the lust for those things has taken over the respect for the lives of our children, of everybody. And we also don't talk about, you know, there are more people killed by suicide by guns. That rate is higher than homicide. And we don't have those conversations. And absolutely what Brandon said, these conversations have to be had. We have to have these conversations with our people of this age as well because nobody's talking to them. And we, they're inheriting our mess and we're not having all of these conversations. And they're the ones being killed. And they're the ones being killed. And the conversations about how important it is to go out to vote. And I can't tell you how many young people, the first thing I say when I meet them, hi, how are you? Have you registered to vote? <laughs> I do. I do it all the time. And they say no because they feel powerless, they feel disenfranchised, they feel hopeless. This is the legacy that they've been given, so what do we do as the generation that caused it to get this conversation going and to empower them and to give them, shower them with the love that they don't see from the hypocrisy that they see in our elected officials and how we hold them accountable that if they don't do it, they have to. And to get the guns out of the hands, so that there's a lot of things going on. But unless we start having all these conversations and really having them, they could be difficult conversations to have, but we've got to have them. And we don't have to agree. Somewhere along the line, somebody has the idea that if you have a conversation with somebody, you have to make them agree with you. We have to understand it's okay to disagree and have civil conversations, even when we disagree strongly, but still know how to have the conversation, nonviolent communication, but especially reach out to this generation and to these generations. The startling truth of what we're talking about is that this country was built on violence. It's in the root. And how many times have we talked about love in this conversation? We've talked about guns, we talked about First and Second Amendment. Well, we haven't talked about love hardly at all. If love was flowing, we wouldn't be talking about any of this. I, I think what's scary to me is that we don't look at these, the political industry understanding that there's an addiction of people who are not well because love does loving things. It's really simple. When you love, you do loving things. When you don't have love, you don't do loving things. We cannot solve all these things cerebrally. We just, we, we're talking our heads, but our hearts are not involved. As long as we're talking out our heads and let's find a way to have a gun, okay, let's get it. We're going to keep killing each other until we keep, have more conversations about love and what is that, about this trauma that makes me i was so afraid that I go kill somebody because I think they're going to kill me. We got to get to the root of the thing. You know, they say guns don't kill people. What do they say? They're saying? It's the, that's the sickness of it. That's the sickness of it. But until we're, we're, we're still, it's like there's an elephant in the room. This country was built like that. And it's still like that. So, at some point, the language has to change. The definitions have to change because as long as we keep using the same words, okay, I was in rehab, right? They taught me some things. I was strung out in, in the 90s, right? And, and they said, if nothing changes, nothing changes. <laughs> right? That's exactly right. So they said, you know, uh, and they said hurt people, hurt people. So now we've got people in politics walking around, people who run government who are sick people. Let's get it just straight honestly. 
are not well. So you can't ask a person who's not well to do something right. Ain't going to happen. Until all of us as a greater group of people understand that, we're going to be talking about this. But we got to change the way we use words and things. And, you know, we use the word racism as one thing or we use. But we don't talk about love in a way that is really precious. The people first, the people that came to this country, they killed so many Native Americans that it changed the ecosystem. Oh, my God. They, they kill so many people so quickly, but yet we, we're not dealing with what's happened in the root. So long as the root is soiled and it jacked up, we're going to be in trouble. I think that's, and where is the love in all of that? I'm, I'm going to stop right there. I don't know why everybody can't um, get behind the idea of if you're going to buy a gun, you, you should go to a background check. I mean, what's, you know, what, what is that, how is that infringing? You have to go to, just think of everything you have to do. I mean, you gotta drive a car, you, you gotta, you, you know, smoke, you know, you gotta be a certain age to do so, so many things. We're talking about uh, um, weapons. So why can't, why can't you be, um, why can't they, why can't you have background checks? Why do we need these assault weapons? You know, like hunters. I mean, you're gonna, you know, you need an AK-47 to shoot a deer. Are you really? Not that that would solve everything. How about mental? You know, just basic things. I, I, every gun owner had to buy insurance. That would, you know, you buy insurance to drive the car after you get after you take lessons and you have to pass a test. You know, so it's it's like I mean who. But they, they fight that. They come up with these ideas and the best thing, second, I don't, there's got to be, even though we disagree, we can agree to disagree or whatever that is, but there's got to be a bottom line where we all agree and why people don't agree that you should have a background check. I don't get that. Even that much. I mean, what did we finally do? They put bump stocks. So, you, so they, 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 I think they passed that, or did they? Or are they still working they on just, that? They did pass that, but that's the, that's some little, the you know. They did. I, I don't get it. I, I, you know, there's assault weapons we don't need, background checks we need. I think if we did that, that would be a big step. It might not, you know, um, prevent a lot of stuff, but at least it's on the books. At least it's official, and then you can build on that. But they they don't even want to get to. That's like first. That's like getting to first base. We're talking about trying to get home. They don't even want to get you know that far. I'm sorry, but I, that always I never could figure out why anybody would like resist that. Mm -hmm.